<laughs> Ever since my edgy atheist phase, I thought about being a Christian. <laughs> to me, being a Christian was like having a friend looking out for you all the time. Never wear mixed fabrics and always watch your veggie tales. It meant having hope after death and in life. Hey, you got baptized. To actually give meaning to all this chaos. Hey, Ma, what do you think? You look like a Christian. Howdy, my fellow friends, Romans, and countrymen. Welcome back to Men's Shampoo Review. Today we're going to be looking at Old Spice Krakengard. Wait, that's not right. Oh shoot, not Krakengard, we're looking at Kierkegaard. So recently we've talked about Kierkegaard's advice for finding God coming from his work, The Lily of the Field and the Bird of the Air. And we covered only one out of three of the discourses in that work. But some of you are also interested in the third discourse about joy. So we're going to skip over the second discourse about obedience and jump right into this one instead, because it is pretty important. After all, we live in a world full of ideologies that offer different beliefs and ways of life. And perhaps some of us choose our life ideology based on what it can offer us. I mean, who chooses to live a life based on ideas that only make your life worse? It's like we're at some ideology supermarket looking at the nutrition facts and trying to determine which one we want. Well, let's take a look at the nutrition facts of Christianity here and figure out how many grams of joy we'll get per serving. So Kierkegaard's third discourse opens with the following. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, unconcerned about tomorrow. Consider the grass of the field, which today is. Do this and learn joy. So today we're going to be using the birds and the lilies as our teachers, which is from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6. Specifically, here's the quote from Matthew 6:26, and I'll add Matthew 6:27 as well because it relates to what we're going to be talking about. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? Now Kierkegaard gives some examples of how the lily and the birds have joy. The lilies are joyful when there's morning dew and the birds get to sing while it works to build its nest. And you as a human might look at this and say, hey, Kierkegaard, this is kinda BS. The morning dew, really? It seems to take so little to give these things joy. Doesn't that mean that their joy is lesser? Kierkegaard replies with, no, for the very fact that what gives them such joy is so little is proof that they themselves are joy and joy itself. But is this truly so? If what one rejoiced over was nothing at all, and yet one truly was indescribably joyful, this would be the best proof that one is oneself joy and joy itself, as are the lily and the bird, the joyful teachers of joy, who, precisely because they are unconditionally joyful, are joy itself. For example, the person whose joy is dependent upon certain conditions is not himself joy. His joy, after all, is out of the conditions and is conditional upon them. But a person who is joy itself is unconditionally joyful. Just as, conversely, the person who is unconditionally joyful is joy itself. Okay, so the birds and the lilies are not just joyful, they're joy itself. I'm also not 100% sure about Kierkegaard's reasoning, how only needing little to be joyful means that one is joy itself. I don't know, what do you think? Comment below. But okay, for the sake of practicality, let's view the birds and the lilies as joy itself. And I assume we want to be joy itself as opposed to joy only upon certain conditions. Now there's a whole other discussion to be had about whether this is even a good thing. I mean, joy itself sounds like infinite joy, and how can you be happy if you can't compare it to being sad? And perhaps the conditions upon which we become joyful can be positive, like if it's a result of self-improvement. Regardless, if we were interested in this joy itself rather than joy subject to conditions, what's our next step? Well, heads up, because there's a big quote incoming that pretty much summarizes the whole thing. Their instructions in joy, which is in turn expressed by their lives, is quite briefly as follows. There is a today. It is. Indeed, an infinite emphasis is placed upon this is. There is a today, and there is no worry. Absolutely none. About tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. This is not foolishness on the part of the lily and the bird, but is the joy of silence and obedience. For when you keep silent in the solemn silence of nature, then tomorrow does not exist. And when you obey as a creature obeys, then there is no tomorrow. That unfortunate day that is the invention of garrulousness and disobedience. But when, owing to silence and obedience, tomorrow does not exist, then in the silence and obedience, today is. It is, and then the joy is, 
as it is in The Lily and the Bird. I immediately thought of the Lao Tzu quote about how if you're anxious you're living in the future. In fact, this whole thing is kind of Taoist in a sense. So we already covered silence, but the TLDR about the whole obedience thing is being obedient to God's will, which is to be accepting of your place in this world he created. One could argue this goes very nicely with Taoism, like a steak in a glass of Pinot Noir. Taoism, to me at least, is all about flowing with the Tao, or the Way. Could God be substituted for the Tao? Probably not in a strictly academic sense, but in a pragmatic sense, maybe. So being obedient and silent in the world of God will grant you this joy, but how exactly? I mean, I get the whole being present thing and how dwelling on the future can kill your vibe, but what's so joyful about this todayness in the world? Consider this, that you can see, that you could hear, that you have a sense of smell, that you have a sense of taste, that you could feel, that the sun shines for you and for your sake, that when it becomes weary the moon begins to shine and the stars are lit, and it becomes winter, that all of nature distinguishes itself, pretends to be a stranger, and does so in order to delight you. Kierkegaard then lists other joys of nature such as plants, autumns, and flocks of birds, just not this flock. Now this isn't your typical sort of appreciate nature spiel. I mean it is that, but certain language points to it being more. Kierkegaard hints that nature is acting for our benefit as humans. At least that's how I'm reading it. And what might one deduce from this? Perhaps that God loves you, or perhaps that the world has more meaning than just the chaos of nature. I don't know, think on it and comment below. I will say this though, nature ain't always friendly to us humans. Natural disasters, animal attacks, all that jazz, you know? How does that factor into the equation? But let's get to the big one, the existentialist question. Existentialism is a broad approach in philosophy that concerns our existence as individuals. And of course a big facticity about our existence is the fact that we're gonna die. Now different existentialist and existential-esque thinkers have their own comments about death. But what might a Christian existentialist say about death? And yet the lily and the bird of course also have cares or sorrows as all of nature has sorrows. Does not all of creation sigh under the perishability to which it has been subjected against its will? It is all subjected to perishability. Okay, so death or perishability is still on the table here. We learned how to be joyful in life through silence, obedience, and an appreciation for God's natural world, but death is still looming out there. Now Kierkegaard starts addressing death by quoting the Apostle Paul, Cast all your care and sorrow upon God. It's short, but let's see what Kierkegaard says about it. See, the lily and the bird do this unconditionally, with the help of unconditional silence and unconditional obedience. They cast, indeed as the most powerful catapult casts something away from itself, and with a passion like that with which a person casts away what he most detests, all their sorrow away and cast it. So we could just cast all our problems onto God, including the big one, death. But how exactly do we do this? I'm assuming we don't take one of those lacrosse sticks and just launch our problems at a church or anything. Well thankfully, Kierkegaard elaborates a little here. You see, when one thinks of the word cast, one thinks about force, but instead, what is to be used and used unconditionally is compliance, and yet one is to cast sorrow away, and one is to cast all sorrow away. So this is again relating back to the whole acceptance of God's world in the universe. And Kierkegaard deduces that once you cast all your sorrow, all you're left with is joy. So it kind of comes full circle. But this casting needs to be unconditional and in its entirety. Now it's not really stated explicitly how God is the solution to our sorrows. The obvious possibility with our sorrow over death is heaven. I mean, I think that's a fair assumption. Kierkegaard has a little point about believing that God cares for you. That could also help as well. Again, I turn to you, my smart viewers, to help fill the gaps. One last quote about the fear of death that might help us out. Consider what concerns you, if not as human beings, then as a Christian. That from a Christian standpoint, even the danger of death is so insignificant to you that it is said, this very day you are in paradise. And thus the transition from time to eternity, the greatest possible distance, is so swift, that even if it were to take place through the destruction of everything, you are in paradise this very day, because from a Christian standpoint, you abide in God. And that's the video. It's kinda messy, still vague, but I think that means we could have some good discussion going on in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, hit the like button and subscribe for more. And if you really enjoy what I'm doing, hit the bell so you'll be notified when I drop. I wanna leave you with one last quote. It relates the book to the Lord's Prayer, and I think it's a good summary of this entire work. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. 
Yes, his is the kingdom, and therefore you must unconditionally keep silent lest you direct disturbing attention at the fact of your existence. But through the solemnity of unconditional silence express that the kingdom is his, and his is the power, and therefore you must unconditionally obey and be unconditionally obedient in submitting to everything, for his is the power, and his is the glory, and therefore in everything you do and everything you suffer, you have unconditionally one more thing to do, to give him the glory, for the glory is his.